Hello, and welcome to the U.S. Department of State and to the Foreign Press Center. This is Conversations with America, a discussion between a senior State Department official and an international NGO, where you can watch and participate in the exchange of ideas. I'm Cheryl Benton, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the, Public, in the Bureau of Public Affairs. Today, we are here to discuss international parental child abductions and how the government and civil society are working to prevent and resolve cases. We've received questions, as usual, on, on today's topic from all around the wor world through our blog, Dipnote, and we've selected several for this broadcast. Now let's meet our guests. We are so privileged to have with us Ambassador Susan Jacobs, who is the Special Advisor to the Secretary for International Children's Issues here at the State Department. Oh, thank you so much for participating with us today. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm delighted to be here. Great. We're also very grateful to be joined by Ernie Allen, who is the President and CEO, and I got to say, of one of the most important national and international organizations, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Thank you for joining us today here today, Alan. No, thank you, Cheryl. Great. You know, the Department of State has no higher priority than the safeguard uh, the welfare of U.S. citizens abroad. And one of our highest concerns is the welfare of our most vulnerable, the children who have been victimized in international parental child abduction cases. Susan, could you start us off by talking about your role as special advisor in this very important area. Sure, Cheryl, thank you. Secretary Clinton has been a lifelong advocate yeah. for children's issues, and so she created this position to bring greater awareness to the dangers of parental child abduction and also to the adoption issue. Mm -hmm. And she charged me with encouraging countries to join Hague and to ensure that our partners in the conventions are implementing it properly. She also asked me to establish good relationships with organizations like NICMIC and other organizations that promote children's rights and protect them. Very good. Now, Ernie, could you uh, talk a little bit about um, the mission at NICMIC? Well, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it, otherwise, it takes too long right. to say. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Cheryl, we are a, as you point out, uh, we're a non-governmental organization, mm -hmm. but we're a unique non-governmental organization in that we work in partnership with the United States Department of Justice, with the State Department. Uh, we're mandated by Congress to serve mm -hmm. as the national resource center for missing and, and exploited children. Uh, to millions of Americans, we're the milk carton people. Mm -hmm. uh, we circulate the photos of missing children through a network of 400 private sector partners. Mm -hmm. And we work with law enforcement in the United States and, and around the world. Our goal is to help families and to bring the children home. Well, that is really great. Um, I guess my first question is, how does the National Center um, for Missing and Exploited Children work together with your office, Susan. I would be inter uh, interested in how that uh, convergence happens. Well, one of the things that Nick Mick does for us is when children are abducted into the United States, Nick Mick, through their law enforcement contacts and their liaison with law enforcement, helps us find these children, which is the, mm. the first step in getting them home. Um, and previously, they did all that work independently of us. Yes. And then we took over that responsibility again in 2008. But another important thing that Nick Mick does is to help parents whose children have been abducted overseas, American families mm -hmm. whose children are taken overseas, by liaising with international law enforcement, with Interpol, with the FBI. And they also help the parents by providing them at least one trip with access, mm -hmm. which is really important mm -hmm. because most of these parents um, don't have the money or the resources to be able to do this on their own. And there are a couple of particular cases that I'm aware of where the parents have been incredibly appreciative of the work that Nick Mick does for them. Well, I can imagine. Um, 
why don't you tell me your perspective and on how you all work together and what that really means to these parents and, and to the, these countries? Well, Cheryl, I think it means a lot. Yeah. I mean, the, the reality is we work hand in hand with the Office of Children's Issues, mm -hmm. and there was no organization, no person more enthusiastic about Secretary Clinton's decision to name Ambassador mm -hmm. Jacobs to this position. I think it sends a loud, clear message uh, to the American public, to these searching parents uh, regarding how important this issue is and that we need to do more because these are American children away from their custodial parents in the United States or foreign children who've been brought to the United States. So our caseworkers work closely with Ambassador Jacobs' mm -hmm. team, mm -hmm. uh, not just to help locate the children, which is our primary yeah. focus, but also, as she points out, to assist these families in, in any way we can. So I think it's a great partnership. Mm -hmm. I think the level of success is the best it's, it's ever been, but there's still too many yeah. children who we've not yet been able to, to bring home, and so there's more work to do. Absolutely. Um, could you talk a little bit about the Hague uh, Abduction Convention? What is sure. that, and how does that work? I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain it. Okay. Actually, this this is a convention that now has 63 partners. Okay. Uh, it is open to any country in the world, and it really focuses on creating a legal framework where countries with differing legal systems can resolve mm -hmm. one basic question. What is the child's habitual residence? Okay. That is really the only question that needs to be answered. So when a child is abducted from the United States, let's say to France, mm -hmm. all the French courts need to do is decide, was this child living in America? And if so, the child needs to be returned to the United States for any further legal proceedings. So we work very closely with the Permanent Bureau. There is a photograph of us working with uh, Ignacio Goicochea, okay. who is uh, one of their legal advisors in Argentina with the Argentine Central Authority so that we can discuss with them how do we do this job better? How do we get law enforcement engaged? How do we ensure that the executive branch of another country is working closely with us as well as the judiciary? And so the, the Hague Convention has a permanent bureau that meets in The Hague, mm -hmm. and we work closely with them in cooperation with other countries in trying to ensure compliance with the convention. But as I said, it's one question. What is the child's habitual residence? And um, is The Hague uh, Convention the best tool for resolving these cases? Um, I hear what you've said, but does it really work? Well, I, I think the answer to that is we think it is absolutely the best tool that okay. we have. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, more countries need to become signatories to the Hague Convention. The goal is to create a uniform, consistent model worldwide wow. so that it doesn't matter where the child is taken. Uh, the, the point, as Ambassador Jacobs indicated, is to return the child to the place of habitual mm -hmm. residence so that those courts can make the determination. Uh, we are frustrated by the lack of consistent application, and so we have worked with The Hague to create good practice guides for uh, signatory countries. Uh, we have worked with The Hague uh, on research to try to measure uh, the level and degree of compliance so that there's a kind of scorecard mm -hmm. so you can identify those countries that are signatories in name only. And then the big challenge, I think, is simply um, how do we apply it in the most consistent way possible? There are exceptions provided mm -hmm. under the convention. In some countries, those exceptions have become the rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, the goal is to, to build a an international system that creates greater consistency and more certainty uh, so that these parents don't feel isolated and left behind and that nobody cares. Right. Um, I have a couple questions here. Um, we've all seen something on maybe a 60 Minutes or a 2020 where there is some real desperation out there. And of course, America is a part of, of the convention. What happens um, if your country is not? Can you use the uh, what is there or, or are you just out of luck? 
Well, it's it's much harder. Yeah. Because there is no treaty that we can point to that says, you promised that you were going to do this and now you need to do it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, we will nag you to death and, and you will have to do it. Mm -hmm. So it it's just much, much harder. There are remedies for parents whose children are taken to a country that is not party to a convention, but it's much harder for them to access the legal system. Unfortunately, we are not attorneys at our various embassies. We are not allowed to represent Americans in court. We can give them a list of lawyers, but oh, that okay. it, it's it's much better if a country is party to The Hague. Right. Is that your experience as well? I, I think that's exactly right, but I think it's also important to note that there are success stories. Mm -hmm. There are countries that are non-Hague signatories from which we uh, are getting American children back. Okay. Uh, for example, India, which we hope will soon be a signatory, uh, is a country in which courts have, on occasion, returned children to the United States. Uh, the State Department and the U.S. government has also had some success with negotiating bilateral agreements okay. with individual countries. Right. So even right. though they're not a party to a global treaty, right. you can work with individual countries. The goal in each case is to figure out within that legal system and based upon the resources and the people who are there in that country, can you work with it? Can you work through it? Can you do whatever is necessary to get the child back? I think we're making progress, but I certainly agree with Ambassador Jacobs that it's far more difficult in yeah. non-Hague countries. Yeah, it's, it's kind of sad. So I, I was curious, what events are planned for both organizations to raise awareness about um, the National Mission Missing Children's Day on May 25th. I know that's pretty much a well, focus right now. Th this is a great start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this Good. is an excellent Good. start. Yeah. We are hosting an open house on May 16th for Left Behind Parents. Wow. And we will have a lot of resources. Ernie will be there, mm -hmm. as well as Interpol, the FBI, okay. the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, all of our partners in trying to bring children home. We are doing um, oh, messages on Diplo blog mm -hmm. and then we will be participating in um, Missing Children's Day on the 25th. That's just some of the events that we're doing but we are trying to raise awareness about the issue right. and I, I think the, the biggest message is for parents not to forget why they fell in love and married each yeah. other and not to take their animosity out on their children. Yeah. That there is a way to resolve these cases with the least harm to the children. But I guess they just get so caught up, they just lose sight of that, don't they? In many cases. I mean, in, not yes, in the cases that yeah, we see, that's, see, that's what happens. That's right. We only see the bad cases. Right. And one of the neat things, I, Ernie and I were talking about this before, is the secretary's commitment and in, in what she's done to raise uh, this she's profile, an she's amazing. She's an amazing woman, right? And she raises this issue all around the world. This right. is a very important issue to her. And I mean, my job is—I mean, Ernie mentioned India. We have had very, very productive conversations with India over the last two years about joining the convention. And one thing we have been able to point out to them is, your judges are already, in some cases, making. Hague-like mm -hmm. decisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it should be easy for you to join this convention. Right. So we hope that happens soon, right? Very soon, yeah. we hope. Cheryl, the, the, you mentioned the leadership of the Secretary yeah. in, in all this. One of the things that she has said consistently that I think is so important here is that this issue is not about obscure legal yeah. issues or legal interpretations. It's fundamentally an issue of human rights. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's all about. And so I think there's enormous progress being made. Uh, that's not enough for some frustrated parents out there who have battled, have mm -hmm. done all the things they're supposed to do, but haven't gotten their children back. Uh, but there is progress. And on May 25th this year, we commemorate National Missing Children's Day for the 30th time. Wow. Uh, but I think it's also important to note that May 25th is being observed as International Missing Children's Day in Canada, in the UK, in Romania, in Greece, in Portugal, in Brazil, That's huge. in Mexico. That's huge. It is becoming a global day yeah. of observation and a recommitment uh, 
uh, to reunite more families and, and bring these children home. Uh, the other point I want to add mm -hmm. in, res in response to uh, what you said just, just a few minutes ago is that research has shown that in 80% of these cases, the motive for the abduction of the child is not love of the child. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. anger or revenge directed at, at the ex-spouse. Mm -hmm. So these kids pay the price. They're the victims, and this has long-term impact emotionally, psychologically, in some cases physically. Uh, so this is not a situation in which people can say, the kid's with a parent, how bad can right. it be? Right. right. The answer is it can be pretty bad. Right, right, exactly. So I want to bring our viewers in, and we've gotten some uh, questions from our blog, Dip Note. Patrick in California writes, can you tell me how the Department of State defines the word abduction? Yes, abduction is the wrongful removal of a child from parental custody. Simple as that, It's right? as simple as that. Right, okay, that, that's great. I was pretty straightforward. So, uh, Denise and... and I thank um, Patrick for that question. Right, because that was a clarifying point. Right. We're going on about nitmic, et cetera, right. and there's a pretty straightforward question. So, Denise in New Jersey writes, uh, why is there no real advocacy on the part of the U.S. government for uh, abducted American children, parents who have filed cons cases consistently recount stories of exasperation in dealing with agencies and organizations? Well, I appreciate the question yeah. and I know that unless your child is returned to you, you yeah. are going to be frustrated yeah. and angry and I get that. I can't, as a parent, imagine anything worse than having right. your child removed from you. Yes. But I would like to assure Denise that the State Department is working nonstop to raise this issue with foreign governments the secretary raises it at every opportunity, as do other principals in the State Department. I travel all around mm -hmm. the world bringing particular cases to the attention of foreign governments and advocating for them to make the right decisions about returning children that have been wrongfully removed from their parents. And you work hand in glove there, don't you, with that? Absolutely, yeah. and, and let me just reiterate uh, what Ambassador Jacob said. I think the U.S. government today is playing a much more aggressive advocacy role in these cases than it's ever played. There have been some high-profile cases, for example, one recently in which the Secretary of State brought up this issue mm -hmm. to the foreign minister of another country regarding a particular child. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that she has appointed Ambassador Jacobs to her role sends a message uh, to how seriously uh, she views this problem. Uh, it's frustrating to us that we can't get all these kids right. back, but I, I think the message is that the U.S. government and its NGO partners are doing more today than ever before to try to bring these kids home. Great. We have another question um, from George in Brazil. Uh, I think this one's going to be for you. Uh, why has the U.S. <laughs> government not implemented the policy of exit immigration controls like the majority of other nations have? First of all, what does that mean and why haven't we done it? Well, right? <laughs> first I want to thank George for yeah. a great question. Um, exit controls would mean when you leave the United States, um, an immigration officer would look at your passport and make sure that there are no wants or warrants out for you okay. that would prevent your departure. Okay. Uh, it would also help us to know who's remaining in the country and enforce um, immigration policies. Gotcha. Uh, this is not something that the, that the State Department is responsible for. I know that Congress has been debating this issue for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, okay. but without being able to find a resolution. We have entry controls, but we don't have exit controls. Okay. Most countries don't care so much about how you get in, but they want you to leave, and so they, <laughs> right. they, they yeah. check right. you yeah, sure. out. But, it would, but I would like to say that despite the lack of exit controls, we do have some protections in place okay. to prevent the wrongful removal of children from the United States. Okay. We have a two-parent consent rule for all children under the age of 16, which means that both parents oh. have to approve that child getting a passport. Now that works much better if the child only has one nationality. It doesn't work as well if a parent is able to go to an embassy, a foreign embassy here in the United States 
and get a passport for the child in some other name. We also have a program where a parent can report to us that they believe their child will be abducted or wrongfully removed and that they have a court order that does not permit that. And if they give us that information, we can pass it to the airlines and to Customs and Border Protection and, oh, and really? hopefully prevent the departure of the child from the United States. So there are a few yeah. things that we can do. Um, it's, it's not enough, and it's, these rules can be easily circumvented. Oh, I'm sure. Now, do you um, advocate as well with Congress? I mean, she said, uh, Ambassador said, 13 years we've been trying to get mm -hmm. something done. Are you part of that advocacy? We, we are, mm -hmm. and, and as she points out, this is a, a serious problem. Yeah. Uh, there is a prevent departure system through Homeland Security for non-U.S. citizens. Okay. Uh, and there are discussions in Congress right now regarding expanding that to U.S. citizens, but there's some legal and constitutional mm -hmm. challenges there. Uh, clearly, we need to have those kinds of systems in place. Uh, the best way to deal with these cases of international child abduction is simply to prevent them. Yes. And this, yeah. is, this is one way to make that happen. Yes, very good. You know, we have another question from Denise in New Jersey. She writes, when a country is designated as a non-compliant or, dem or demonstrating patterns of non-compliance with the Hague Convention, does this trigger any specific action on the part of the U.S. government, and what would then be the role of, of NGOs in that? Regard? Well, you know, I, I, th I think uh, this is an issue that the State Department addresses in terms of taking steps with, with other countries to try to assist in improving compliance. Uh, we funded uh, research uh, through a law professor in the U.K. for the Hague Convention on uh, on the measure of compliance on how countries are doing and then we attempt to work with the Hague to encourage those countries to improve their level of, of compliance. Um, but I, I think this is largely a process of education and encouragement. Uh, I don't see any legal uh, hammers mm -hmm. that we can use to bring about compliance. And, and the research showed that, not surprisingly, with uh, now, 86 total signatories, about 63, I think you said, that, that are active and compliant with the United States. Um, the level of compliance varies mm. widely, and it's like a lot of other challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of the reasons what NGOs like ours are trying to do is to educate and persuade. Uh, mm. There are a lot yeah, of judges yeah. whose position is, I'm a judge. I don't care what a judge in another country has said. Right. I'm going to decide what I think is in the best interest of, of this child. What we're trying to avoid is relitigating right. uh, these uh, cases yes. mm -hmm. one country at a time. And, and that's, a, that's a long process, but I think both of us are actively engaged in it. Yes. And if, yes. if I could mention, yeah, oh, we, sure. we also have a compliance report. Okay. And it cites countries for noncompliance. It rates them on three different criteria judicial compliance, legal compliance, um, executive branch compliance. And in a couple of countries that we cited this year, we got compliance afterwards. Uh, we went and talked okay. to them. We explained why we had found them noncompliant, and we have had returns from those countries afterwards. In another country that we just visited, they joined the convention 17 years ago, never wrote implementing legislation, never did anything wow. to adhere to the convention. And the attorney general of this country said to me, well, I don't understand. It's only one case. I said, well, I'll bring his mother here, and you tell her oh, yeah, that yeah. it's only one case. Yeah. They wrote their legislation. They're going to okay. grandfather this case okay. and deal with it. So I think you that, human that the... It. The, the education that we do, the education that NICMIC helps us do, yeah. the interactions with other central authorities, working with the Permanent Bureau, having mm. special commission meetings where sometimes countries get called out for okay. their noncompliance, are very, very helpful in getting countries to adhere to their treaty obligations. Yeah, I like what, that you put a human face on it to, uh, in that one yeah, case. It's like it's it, it makes all the difference in mm -hmm. the world, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, 
we're at the close, and it's very wow. sad because this is such <laughs> a good so conversation. <laughs> such a great conversation. And um, uh, maybe, Susan, you could share some final thoughts with us, and then, Ellen, if you could as well. Sure. sure. I, I, right. I know how frustrating it must be for a parent to have a child abducted. And, and I know that we could do more, yeah. and we are trying to. We have more officers now working on abduction cases. We are trying to build better relationships. But until we get every child home, we won't be successful. And we're not forgetting about any child, no matter how long the case has been open. But, and I would also like to encourage parents to let us know when this happens so that we can keep better records, so that we can continue to work with countries that are non-compliant to urge their compliance. Very good. Ernie, before you make your comment, I do have a question. Um, is it your organization responsible for the AMBER Alerts? I know that's a burning question out there. I just know it. Well, it is. Uh, the AMBER Alert <laughs> was created as a result of one community. Okay. So it was the idea of the Dallas-Fort Worth Radio Broadcasters Association and Dallas-Fort Worth Area Law Enforcement after the abduction and murder of one little nine-year-old girl in Arlington, Texas in mm -hmm. 1996. Okay. Um, they applied it. It worked. They came to us in 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the FCC, uh, helped build a system. Congress then uh, passed a law in 2003 there are now 120 AMBER plans mm. across the United okay. States. 572 children have been saved, rescued as really? a direct result of AMBER alerts. And the most amazing thing is the, the power of a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, today, the AMBER alert has been implemented in Canada, parts of Mexico, oh, no. uh, the United Kingdom, France, uh, Greece, Romania. Oh, that's fantastic. It is expanding yeah. worldwide. And we act as the hub on behalf of the Justice Department for taking the reports from law enforcement and then mobilizing what we call secondary AMBER alerts, utilizing Facebook, uh, the, the Internet. Uh, there's a wireless AMBER alert that all the major cell phone providers are engaged in. So it is a concept that is free mm -hmm. and works and saves kids' lives. So the answer is yes, we're involved, yeah, good, good. but it was not our idea. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. Because you're, you're doing it. You're doing, your organization is wonderful. And Thank you. just appreciate that. Well, that concludes this session of Conversations. I'd like to thank Special Advisor Ambassador Susan Jacobs and Ernie Allen for sharing uh, your work and knowledge with, with us. I'd also like to thank each of you for joining us today. We hope that Conversations with America will continue to inform citizens about the administration's efforts to address the challenges of the 21st century and our work with uh, non-governmental organizations around the globe. We look forward to engaging with you very soon. Thank you very much.